I guess uh, we'll let people trickle in a little bit, and uh, but we'll go go ahead and get started, right? Uh, so that you guys can go home and eat your dinners and watch your Rosa de Guadalupe or whatever it is that you watch, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, somehow that's been coming up all week, Rosa de Guadalupe, right? You know, like, I don't, my mom watches it, and I say, Ma, ¿por qué le gustan las mentiras? Right? Just a bunch of lies, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, a few years ago, uh, when I was a, an associate, you know, still learning how to be a priest, and uh, it was during my first two years, and, and one day I, w- I went to, to, uh, to Walmart, and, and I was wearing my clerics, and I was walking through Walmart, and, and this guy kept following me. Right, this guy who's tattooed, bald headed, and I, and I was walking through all the aisles, and you know I would stop, and he would stop there, and he would look at me, and I was like, oh man, you know, I was like, I'm in trouble, right? This guy, you know, and I thought, my, I thought to myself, man, he's going to, he's going to hurt me, right? So <clears throat> we're going around, and and uh, finally I pay for my stuff, and he pays for his stuff, and he walks out right next to me, right? And I'm like, oh man, this is it, like I'm going to get mugged. Right? I mean, this is a tall guy, bald head, lots of lots of tattoos. Right? He looks mean, and I'm just like, oh man, this is it. I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die today. You know. So then uh, he he you know as we're walking, he says, hey, and I turn around and say, yes, are you a priest? You know, and I said, uh, uh, what do I say? I mean, I had co- the collar on, right? I could say, no, no, I'm just wearing a costume. No, you know, then I'd be lying, right? So. So I said, uh, yeah, yes, yes, I'm a priest. Are you a Roman Catholic priest? I said, oh, man. Right? Now, this is right after all the, the chaos, right? All the scandal and stuff with McCarrick and all that stuff. And so I'm just thinking to myself, man, he's going to get me, right? And, uh, he, says, and, he, and he, says, he, he said, uh, he goes, well, I'm glad to see you. And I said, oh, okay, right, right. He says, now, Father, I haven't gone to confession in so many years. You think you can hear my confession? And I said, absolutely, <laughs> right? And so, so we, actually, we actually went, uh, you know, around the, the side of, of Walmart, and I, and I heard his confession out there, right? And, uh, and that, was, that, was, that was the first time. The second time was uh, I was, uh, uh, you know, I was in charge of the young adult ministry at my, my first parish. And, uh, you know, I started this thing called uh, uh, Praise and Worship and then a Social, Right. Uh, and so what we would do is we would do praise and worship, we would have adoration, and then we would go out, right, to different places. And, and of course, the young adults were in charge of picking the place, right? So they chose to go to a pub, right? And so, of course, I'm wearing my collar, right? And so, uh, so we walk into this pub, right? And first, you know, you see all these people looking like, what is that? Is that a priest? You know? And, and, uh, and then one guy yells out, he goes, hey, priest! And I said, oh, crap. He says, I'm so glad to see you. Let me buy you a beer. I said, Whew, okay, let's do it, right? <laughs> buy me a beer, right? Uh, but, but it's interesting because, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, as, as priests, you know, we forget that, that uh, people see us in our collars and immediately it witnesses to them about something bigger than all of us, right? Uh, as a priest, you know, even, even with all the scandals and stuff that has happened in the church, the priesthood is still something that that uh, that is sought after, right? People look for the priest, you know. And uh, you know, I've had I've had you know one part of my ministry that I do is is uh, is deliverance, right? And so I work with, you know, with with demonic things, right? And uh, uh, I've had multiple times when I've had uh, Protestants who've come to the Catholic Church to see me because their pastor couldn't do anything about the demon in their house, and so they were coming to talk to Father. Right, and so they're like, "Well, you know, the, our pastor said that you could probably take care of it." <laughs> well, you know, there's an easy, simple solution. Why don't you come on in? Right, come into the church. Right, uh, and, and, I, and I have had I've had a few people that, that have actually come into the church. You know, but but you know, one one thing that I do love is I love being Catholic. You know, I love being Catholic, and 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 uh, now being a priest, I mean, it, it's just a, it just intensifies the love for the Catholic Church and the and the faith that we have. Right. Uh, you know, I might not agree with everything that the leaders of the church do or say. That's not my problem, right? My, my main goal is to be able to lead people to heaven. And that's, what I'm, that's why I was called to be a priest, right? And the greatest thing that I get to do is to celebrate the Eucharist, right? That's the greatest thing I get to do, right? Uh, the first time that, that uh, you know, in the seminary, you know, we, we, we practice, you know, uh, celebrating Mass, right? There's a little fake chapel, and you sit there, oh, you pray, oh, this is going to be great, 
But it's not until the day you get ordained and then you, the first time you actually say those words in persona Christi, when that bread and that wine become truly the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And the interesting thing, too, is that as, as I pray those prayers, as Father Miguel prays those prayers, as any of us priests pray those prayers, we are saying in first, the first person, because we, too, at that moment, are uniting ourselves to the sacrifice. Right? We become the lamb along with Jesus. Right? Uh, this is my body. It's Jesus saying it, but it's also Father Henry, Father Miguel, whichever priest is saying it, as their personal uh, sacrifice as well. This is my blood, right? It's a, it's a unity of, of Christ, right? This communion, right? And, and so I, I just love being a priest, and I love being Catholic. I love being Catholic. And, you know, honestly, the, the reason why I became a priest or that I, I said yes to the priesthood was precisely because of all the scandal, right? I said, you know what? I said, I'm tired of hearing all this stuff about bad priests. You know, I'm going to go become a priest so that I can beat those priests into submission. No I'm kidding. <laughs> But it, it was those things. It was like, you know, I, I want to be a priest because I feel God is calling me to be a priest who is going to be able and willing to give his life to sanctify the people of God, right? So that's why I'm a priest, right? But again, the Eucharist, best thing ever, right? There is nothing greater than the Eucharist. There is no greater love than, than the Eucharist for us, right? There is, there is nothing better or more powerful than when we come to the Eucharist, Right? Uh, you know, Padre Pio, you know, there's a story of Padre Pio that, you know, his confreres, they were trying to do a deliverance, an exorcism over a lady. And, and as, as uh, they were doing all the, the ritual, they were doing the, the ritual, the exorcism ritual, right? The actual ritual. And, of course, they couldn't get that demon out of the lady. And so he, you know, they bring her, they, they come and speak to Padre Pio and said, Father, we've done everything that we're supposed to do, but this demon does not leave her. As a matter of fact, it laughs at us, you know? And so then Padre Pio says, don't worry, bring her to Mass. Yeah. And so, so they bring her to Mass. She walks in, no problem, right? Demon, does, demon doesn't bother one thing. Mass begins, the readings begin. And then when Padre Pio says the prayers of consecration over the host, and he lifts up the host, immediately the demon and the woman begins to screech in pain. And he says, it is you, and leaves the woman immediately. So, I mean, this, these are, this is the power of the Eucharist, right? And so I think, I think for us, especially during this time that we have the, the, Eucharistic, revi the, the Eucharistic revival in the, in the church in the United States, I think it's important for us to really go back and reflect. This is kind of why last, last night the homework was for you to go read John chapter 6, right, and, 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 and just kind of reflect on those questions. Do you know, why do I really believe? Right? How do I, when I, when I think about Jesus in the Eucharist, what do I feel? Because it's important to not just make it about an academic exercise in belief, but to actually be a lived experience of the living God in the Eucharist, right? And I think that's important for us, and we've lost that a lot. I mean, that's, that's one of the biggest things that, that, that's happened. You know, there's, there's been survey after survey that show that Catholics themselves, I think it was like 65% of Catholics believe that what we have is only a symbol and represents Jesus. But that's not right. That's not true. That has never been what the church teaches. If you really want to know, go back to the early church fathers, and you'll see that from the very beginning, from the very beginning, the church fathers have always made it very clear that the Eucharist is truly Christ Jesus. I mean, you look at, you look at Paul, even the letters of Paul, where he's talking about the, the Eucharist, right? He says, is not the bread that we, that we break, is, that, is it not our share in the body of Christ? Is not the, the chalice that we bless, is that not the, the chalice of, of Christ's blood, right? So he's very clearly making it clear that it is truly what it is, right? And that's why he makes a big deal about not receiving unworthily, right? If it was just a symbol, he'd say, well, okay, just take it, right? It doesn't matter. But he makes it very clear that there is a, there is a real danger of receiving it unworthily. And why? Because the Eucharist is the living God and the God who loves us, right? So tonight we're going to go into the Eucharist. Is this thing on? Oh, I guess I should click it on, right? Oh, I don't know. I'm not used to these fancy things, right? So we're going to go into the Eucharist today. And, you know, just to recap, right? 
Yesterday we dove into God's covenant of love, right? So God throughout human existence has always sought to give us a new chance to follow his divine love for us and to become more intimately united to him, right? All these covenants are finally fulfilled in Jesus, right? So all these covenants here, they're all about God who reaches out to humanity, right? They're about God reaching out to humanity and wanting to bring us back into right relationship with him, right? That's what the, the, the covenants are about, right? God says, hey, you messed up. It's okay. I love you. Let me give you something else. Hey, you messed up again. Hey, I still love you, but I love you more. Now let me give you something more, right? And so he keeps going until finally his promise of the new and eternal covenant, right? That, that promise that he made in Genesis 3.15 where, where he makes it very clear that there will be an offspring who will have enmity, right? The offspring of the woman, the offspring of the serpent, who we know is to be the devil, right? That there will be enmity between them, meaning complete contrast to each other, right? So now here, throughout these covenants, the, the, the ultimate covenant, covenant, the last covenant, that the one that seals all covenants, the new and eternal covenant, is Jesus, right? And... It says in John chapter 3, verse 16, and we know this verse very well, right? You ask a Protestant, hey, John 3, 16, oh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? I mean, phew, they got it, right? So yeah, so, the, so, so that's truly what happens here. This is how, how now God fulfills the promise of salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish but might have eternal life. So the love story between God and man culminates, culminates with the greatest and final gift that God gave us, his son, right? So when we think back, right, we think back to the time of, of, of Abraham and Isaac, right? God who calls Abraham to, to sacrifice his son, but then God says, don't hurt him, right? But now here is God who sends his only begotten son into the world, and does not hold back, right? And all that for love of you and me, right? So his son, in turn, by his gift, gave us the promise of eternal life and adoption as sons and daughters of God, right? So God, Jesus came and he gave us the promise of eternal life and he gave us the, the ability to be adopted sons and daughters of God, Right? Notice, notice that God, that Jesus never came and, and said, hey, if you, don't, if you don't shape up, that's it. You're going to be smitten. Right? He did say, you know, there's the risk that if you don't do what God's commandments are, you will, you know, have to uh, answer to God. Right? Justice. God is just. Right? We, we do so, what, such a wonderful job of God is love, God is mercy, but we forget if God is just. Right? Now, let me ask you a quick question. Who decides where we go at judgment? We do, right? We do. How? By our sins, by our, our, our consistent rejection of God's love for us, right? And, and, I, and I say this oftentimes, you know, especially when, when we read the, the, the gospel of, of Lazarus and, and, the, and the rich man, Right? You know, we, when, we, when we think about hell, we think about this guy with, with long horns, big, long tail, red with a pitchfork, right? right? We think about that, right? And, and the thing is that, yeah, that's, that's an that's a alliteration, right? It, it's something that, 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 that kind of moves us to this place of fear, right? Oh, my gosh, it's an ugly thing, right? But the reality is if we look at, at, that, at that gospel of, of Lazarus and the rich man, you see that reality, what, what is actually burning is the deep desire for God in the rich man that can never be quenched. Think about it. Right? The rich man is looking up to heaven. He sees Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham. He says, Father Abraham, Father Abraham, if only they could bring me just a drop of water. And what does Abraham say? I cannot, because there is a great chasm between you and us. So you cannot come here, and, I, and we cannot go there, right? 
So there is this thing where, it's, where we, can, we can be in hell, and it means that we're still able to see and have that desire for God, but can never have relationship with God. And that's the thing that burns within us, right? That separation from God, right? So this is what, this is what Jesus, uh, John 3, 16, but then uh, John 1, verse 12, something very powerful that I think we need to keep in mind always, along with that idea of being separated from God, but to those who did accept him, he gave power to become children of God, right? So when we live in union with Christ, we are actually then taking up that promise, taking up that invitation of being beloved children of God, right? Now, I don't know about you, but I, I like the idea of being a child of God, right? Uh, I, I did enough, enough stuff in my past life that I don't want to go back to that, right? I'd rather stay right here where I am, right? So by the simple fact that you and I have been baptized into Christ, we are all sharers of the promise of eternal life and in being children of God. Christ then shares with us the gift of his sanctifying grace, right? So remember that all these things, right, these, the, all these different things that, that we received, right, in the, in the covenants, right, these were all kind of like external things. They were external things. God says, hey, follow this and just do that. Follow this and just do that. Follow this and just do, you know. And, and so there was, it was this whole process of just live in union with me through my commandments, through what I, I, I direct you to do, right? But now the sanctifying, the sanctifying grace is made specially available through the sacraments, right? The sacraments are those gifts that, that Jesus gives us that continue to bring about the sanctifying grace for us, and specifically, specifically, the Eucharist. The Eucharist, right? But whenever we talk about the, the, the Eucharist being the source and summit, whenever we talk about the Eucharist, we have to go into a deeper place. It cannot be just an exercise in intellect, right? It cannot be that, right? Uh, I mean, we can explain everything, right, in intellect, but it's not about explaining it. It's about living it, right? It's about having a relationship with Jesus Christ, right? So we cannot just simply be superficial in our belief, but rather we have to go to the very depth of the reality that what is underlying the Eucharist, what is underlying the Eucharist, the true presence of Christ, is the love that Christ has for us. That's when we, come, when we come to the Eucharist and we come to that, 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 that solidification of that final covenant of God's love for us in the Eucharist. It is when we come to the Eucharist and we're coming and we're saying, I love you, Lord, because I know that you love me. And that's why now you have given yourself to me in the Eucharist. Right? So, of course, like I said, John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whoever believe in him may not perish but may have life everlasting, right? And then, of course, we hear in John 6, 25, I am the bread of life. Who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Right? Now, Father John Hardin, he's a Jesuit, he says, behind the incarnation and therefore behind the Eucharist is the breathtaking, inevitable love of God. The Eucharist is love incarnate. That is to say, he is truly the loving and merciful presence of Jesus who gave his life for us out of love for us. Right? So Jesus gives, he gave his life out of love for us. Right? And the Eucharist is precisely that. It is the incarnate love of God. <laughs> right? It is the incarnate love of God. Now, have you ever thought, right, have, have you ever thought that why we have this constant desire to do better, to be happy, right? We spend our lives trying to, to rise up in a, in a greater level, you know, in, in, in your job or buy a bigger house or a nicer car, which are not bad things in themselves. But have, have you ever wondered what is underlying all that? What is underlying this place of I just want to be happy, the reality is that what we are doing, what we have, is the thirst and hunger for, for God. 
You see, every one of us, by our, by our creation, we have an innate desire for God. Everyone has a burning desire for God, right? Everyone. Even those who say that they don't believe in God, you better believe they believe in God. Because why? Oh, I just believe in being good. Why? Why? If you ask them why, well, that's just because that's what we're supposed to do. Why? Why do you feel that you have to do good if you don't believe in any kind of being above you? Why? Oh, it's just the right thing to do. Who told you it's the right thing to do? Right? So everyone has a deep desire for God. Everyone does. But they might not say that it's God who they desire. They might just say that it's you know, something bigger. Right? Uh, you, know, so, you know, sometimes they'll say, oh, I just want to become a better version of myself. Well, well what does that mean? What does that mean? How do you measure the better version of yourself? Right? Oh, I just want to be a good human being. Okay, but what's the measurement of a good human being, and where does that come from? You see, so, so everyone has a desire for God, an innate desire for God. And it's all that, that everything that we pursue, trying to make ourselves happy, as a matter of fact, even sin itself is actually a pursuit of trying to fulfill something within us that, that we feel lacking. Oh, that's pretty crazy, right? Sin? You mean sin? Yes, sin. Sin is actually something that we do because we feel something is lacking, right? Yeah? So we all have hunger and thirst for, for God, right? Things that are not attainable here on earth, you know, these earthly realities. But all these, this happiness, this eternal happiness is attainable to us here on earth through the Eucharist. If we unite ourselves to the Eucharist, we find the strength and we experience the fullness of God's love for us, right? There's, there's a great, deep desire and fulfillment in when we receive the Eucharist, right? Just like I said, whenever the first time that I celebrate Mass and I said those prayers of consecration, I cried. I cried. And I'm not, I'm not usually the one that cries very easily, but I cried. Because at that very moment, I realized that what was, the one that was in my hand was now Christ Jesus, that he had become present. And, 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 I don't, and even when I celebrate Mass now, I just keep think, thinking, this is him. He is here, right here. He is right here. He is right in that tabernacle, right there with us right now. And, he's, and, it all, and it's all about love, right? The Catechism 1323 says, at the Last Supper on the, on the night before he was betrayed, our Savior instituted the Eucharistic sacrifice of his body and blood. This he did in order to perpetuate the sacrifice of the cross throughout the ages until he should come again, and so to entrust to his beloved spouse, the church, a memorial of his death and resurrection, a sacrament of love, a sign of unity, a bond of charity, a paschal banquet in which Christ is consumed. The mind is filled with grace. And a pledge of future glory is given to us. That's the catechism. It's very clear, isn't it? It's a sacrament of love, the sacrament of unity, the sacrament of grace that, 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 that fills us with grace and gives us the pledge of future glory. Now, what does Jesus say? If you eat my, my flesh and what? What happens? You have, you have eternal life. Right? And then he says on the contrary, right? What does he say on the contrary? If you do not, you don't have it, right? <laughs> you're, yeah, you're down. That's a good word, right? That, that's the old translation of the Bible. All right, we're going to go back to the... <laughs> so, so, so Jesus makes it very clear that the Eucharist is the source of love, right? It's the source of love of God incarnate, but it's also that pledge of eternal life, Right? So now here is, remember we talked about how the sacrifice of the lambs, right? There was a sacrifice that had to take place with the new covenant. Well, here is the lamb. Here is the lamb. Not only is he the lamb, but he's also the priest who does the sacrifice, right? And the, the, the wood of the cross is the altar on which the sacrifice has been done. But the sacrifice of this lamb is a once and for all sacrifice, Right? Once, he's, once he did it, it is done. This is why the words that Jesus says, he says, it is finished. 
It's done. No more needs for, for you to sacrifice animals. It is done. And now, it, yes, yeah, the consummation of it. And now all of you have access to the sacrament of love, the promise of eternal life, and salvation, salvific grace. Guys, I can go on and on, but I'm going to try to stay on task, right? Because otherwise you guys will be here and Father Miguel will kick me out, right? So as we spoke of yesterday, God in his love pursued us throughout the ages. Finally, when we, he saw that the time was right, he sent his only begotten son to take upon himself our fallen nature. And then to take it to the cross. So here now, Jesus becomes the sacrificial lamb of God. He becomes the offering of expiation that allows for us to come to God in a more real way. Right? Throughout the centuries of salvific history, God had a deep yearning to be intimately united to us. Throughout the covenants he, that he gave us, he only sought to give us the ability to ascend in love to his love. Right? That's the whole thing about the covenants. Right? The whole thing in the covenants is that he wanted us to ascend to his love. And so now we come to the Eucharist. Now with this eternal covenant, God is able to unite himself to us. It is a sacrament of the Eucharist that the Lord not only invites us to come to him, but actually comes down to us. Right? This God who the Israelites saw as far off and unattainable, untouchable, has now in the proper time come down to us. Which brings us back to the original purpose of our creation, to live in the blessedness of God. God now has returned through the sacrifice of his son, and now the Eucharist has returned to have communion with us. And he calls us then to return in communion with him, right? So the Lord not only invites us to come to him, but he actually comes down to us, and it is no longer an external reality of seeking God. It is now an intimate reality that the God of the universe, the God who created all things, now humbles himself out of love for you and me and enters into our fragile and sinful bodies and souls. This is a God of love. It is a sacrament of the Eucharist that all the loves are united, right? And so you look up here, you know, uh, you have philia, right? Philia is the Greek word for the love that says, I am always here for you, right? Eros, which sometimes we think about erotic, right? And we think naughty, naughty, right? But actually, eros is I desire you, right? I desire you. As a matter of fact, in a married, in a married couple, there should be eros. I desire you. Not because of what you give me, but because I just love you so much that I desire you to be with me. And then finally, it's agape. I will die for you. Right? So now God, in the Eucharist, we have the presence of all three of those loves simultaneously. We have our God who says, I am always here for you. What does Jesus say? I am with you to the end of time. Right? He is always with us. And he says, I desire you. Right? I desire you. God desires us intimately and powerfully. And then he says, I will die for you. And he did. So now in the Eucharist, all three of these loves have come together. All three of these loves have, have come together and, and are expressed perfectly in the Eucharist. Jesus is the perfect friend that walks with us and has our back, right? Now, I love Father Miguel, right? He's, he's my best friend. I love him. He has my back, right? If I, get in, if I ever get in a fight, I'm going to call Father Miguel, and he's going to come beat him up for me, right? Yeah? <laughs> or, we might, or we might both get beat up, but hey, we'll share an experience, right? <laughs> but so we, we know what it means to have a friend that has our back. We know who, when we have a friend that we say, hey, I can rely on that person, Right? I can call upon that person when I need them. Well, Jesus is that perfect friend who is always, always has our back. He is the lover full of passion who will do any crazy thing to get our attention. You want proof of that? If you start, if you, yeah, I would encourage you to go and look up the Eucharistic miracles around the world. 
Mm. God, Jesus is so crazy in passion for us that he's willing to even show himself truly in the Eucharist. He is also that perfect love who gave his life for us on the cross. In his perfect plan of love, God wants to be present with us. We are body and soul, and of course the body needs something that it can touch, it can see, and it can feel, right? So the Lord gave us a Eucharist. I remember when I, when I was in school, I've always been a nerd for reading, right? And, and so I would read, you know. Of course, I hated forced reading, right? When teachers said, you have to read this, I wouldn't read it on purpose. Because it was, you know, it was just, you know, my, my, my desire was, hey, I'm going to read, but I don't want to read what you tell me to read, right? So, so I, but I read, right? I read, I read, I read, and I read, right? And I, and I took lots of notes, and, and, and it was very interesting because, you know, my thing was that the, the way for me to learn was to read it and then to write it, right? That's the type of learning that I do, right? So what would happen is when it was time for exams, I would be sitting down watching movies and eating popcorn and pan dulce with, with Father Miguel, right? Whereas a lot of the other guys were freaking out, like in the library, oh my gosh, we got to study. I don't know how to get this. I don't know. And they're like, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you studying? Well, because I got this, man, right? But you see, all of us have different needs, right? Tactile and, and visual and, and even and all the different senses. Some of us need all our senses, right? So Jesus, knowing that, knowing that we are finite beings who, who need that, gives us these beautiful, beautiful sacraments that allow us to have a tactile encounter with grace. And so he gives us his body and blood in the Eucharist so that we can have that touch, that taste, that sight. Right? As human beings, we are able to encounter him in a real way. Right? And now there, there are many reasons why you know, Jesus gave himself to us in the Eucharist. Right? There are many, many reasons why. Right? And there's many, there's many reasons that, that we continue to have it. Right? So the Eucharist, of course, is the gift of love. We've already exp- expressed that. Right? The Eucharist is a gift of love. When we love somebody, we feel the need to give. Funny story. Right? So, I'm a priest now, by the grace of God, right? But I was always a woman man, right? Since, the kin- since kindergarten, I had a girlfriend in kindergarten. Her name was Rachel, right? And Rachel was this little blonde-headed girl that I don't even know she knew that I was her boyfriend, right? So, of course, because Rachel was my girlfriend, I felt the desire to give her something. So I went to Mama's jewelry box. And I looked and I found the very pretty necklace because I wanted Rachel to know that I thought very much about her. So I give, I take the necklace and I give it to Rachel. (laughs) Without Mama knowing, right? Mom had no idea because, I mean, you know, mom, you know, as moms, right, as, as ladies, you have lots of jewelry that perhaps you say, oh, I forgot I even had that, right? So mom didn't know she had that necklace. Let's be fair, right? She had no idea. She didn't remember that necklace. Well, what happened is Rachel's mom sends a letter to my mom and says, hey, Henry gave a necklace to Rachel, and it's a necklace with all these beautiful gems, There's four gems on it. Turns out that that necklace was the birthstone necklace that my father had given her when all of us were born. So now my mom is wanting to get the necklace back, right? Mom said, go get it. And of course, dad, right? Dads, right? Oh, you can't make your sons look bad, right? Oh, honey, let her her have it. I'll get you another one. No, no, that's fine. You know, so it was this whole thing with mom and dad. But you see, the thing is that when we really care for somebody, right, we want to give. When we love, we want to give, right? We give chocolates, right? We give necklaces, (laughs) right? But in this case, 
Jesus, who loves us, gave himself to us. His entire self out of love for us. And then, of course, Christ present in the Eucharist accompanies us, right? So he wants to be here for, for, you, for us. He wants to keep us company. He wants to listen to our problems and share in our joys. He wants to walk with us, to carry us in the moments when we do not have the strength to walk. How many of you have ever gone to, to, to adoration and you just come in and you're just like, Lord, there's so much on me right now and I just want to be here. I just want to be here and just give it to you right now. Let you take it. And it's surprising how even when we do that, when we leave, it, it feels so much better. Like I remember when I was, when I was discerning to, 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 to petition to be ordained because, guys, I didn't want to be a priest, right? I love being a priest now, but I did not want to be a priest, right? So it took me a lot of time to write the letter to petition to be ordained. So part of it is you get a letter. It's, it's, it's just a standard letter, and they say, okay, you take this, and now you take this blank sheet of paper, and you write what's on that on this piece of paper, and then you sign it, and then you turn it in. And then we send it to the bishop, and the bishop says yes or no, right? Okay. So I wrote the letter. I copied it exactly how it was, but I didn't sign it. I left it on my desk. I said, I'll be back, right? Went off. And I didn't, didn't think anything about it. I was like, nope. I'm not ready for this, right? I went to the, to the chapel. I prayed. Nope, not ready for this. Kept going, kept going. And then eventually, one night, it was time for adoration, and they exposed the Blessed Sacrament. And when they exposed the Blessed Sacrament, I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Do you really want me to be a priest? Because, man, I am a horrible person. Right? I am the worst sinner there is. I mean, there is no sinner b- better than me. Right? If, you, if you get a list of all the sins, I check them all off. Right? I said, there's no way that you're calling me. Right? Well, Jesus knows how to answer. Right? And at that very moment, there was a priest who had been praying there, and he comes walking up, and he says, you know, the Lord is calling you to be a priest, right? And I said, oh, I hate you. Right? Right? And so... <laughs> Oh, I hate you, you know. And, uh, I say this to Father Miguel, you know, because, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll joke around and stuff, right? And sometimes he, like, he's a, he's a teaser and he's a jokester, right? So he'll do things that, that just aggravate me, right? And so, but, so I said, you know, I said, bro, you know what? I love you, but I hate you, you know? And he just starts laughing. I was like, he goes, oh, I know, <laughs> right? So that's what I felt at that moment, right? I was like, Lord, I love you, but I hate you. <laughs> like, you weren't supposed to answer me this quick, Right? And so then I went, I ran to my room and I immediately signed the letter and I went to the secretary, to the rector's secretary and I slid under her door and I said, okay, it's out of my hands, right? Done. And then of course the bishop sends the letter and says, yes, I accept you. I was like, oh man. It's like, okay, fine. <laughs> now do I regret it? Absolutely not, right? I think, I think that the Lord was very clear and, and, I, and I'm happy to be a priest, right? So the Lord continues to accompany us through the Eucharist, right? He continues to accompany us through the Eucharist. The Lord also feeds us in the Eucharist, right? It is the bread of life that strengthens us when we face temptations, right? Imagine whenever we find ourselves in that place where we're struggling with some kind of temptation, you come to adoration and you walk out and you're like, okay, Lord, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try this again. Right? And then the Eucharist heals us. The Eucharist, you know, heals us because we are wounded by sin, right? We are wounded by sin, either by our own sins or by the sins of others, right? We're wounded by our, our sufferings that we experience. We carry our wounds and, and we tend to hide them in places where nobody can see them, right? I mean, think about it. Think about it right now. There's probably something in your life that not very many people know and you don't want them to know, Right? We, we all hide something. We all have a wound that we hide, right? No one can see them except for Jesus. Jesus in the, in the Eucharist can reach all those places in us of woundedness and help, unite, to help heal us and unite ourselves to him. So every time we come to the Eucharist, it is a moment in which we receive the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the good physician, and he enters and he heals everything within us. 
He's completely united to us. And that leads us to the Eucharist changes us. The Eucharist does change us. Once we have a place of understanding, right, that the Lord is powerfully present in the Eucharist, He begins to change us. We become, we become someone new. Right? Because the love of God becomes so real. We want to love God in return. So the Lord, so remember we heard from Moses, right? He says, I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. Choose life then that you and your descendants may live, right? Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. So when presented with this love of God, we have two choices. We have two choices, and only two choices. The choices are we can reject him. We can reject that love completely. Or we can decide to love him in return. Right? There's only two choices. And like I said, in the end, our choice is what we get, right? And that's our choice, right? It reminds me of, of another story. And I love stories, right? I love stories. But it reminds me of a story. So, you know, one time, it was Christmas, right? And we had a Christmas party with our family members. And there was all these gifts, right? Of course, you know that, that, that uh, white elephant game, right? So, you know, <laughs> there was all these different gifts, right? There was, there were little tiny ones and really big ones and all, you know, these kind of things. And so, so we get to the, to the white elephant and I got the last number, right? I get the last number. So now I can either steal or I can go get a gift, right? And the only one that's left is this big box, right? There's a big box. And I'm like, oh, there's got to be something good in that, right? Like there's got to be, there's got to be a really good thing in that, Right? And so, so, of course, you know, there's, there's been gift cards, right? There's headphones. I mean, it's just been great, right? But I'm looking at that box. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take that box, right? So I go and I take the box. Poor choice. It was a box of trash bags and paper plates. So, of course, now I'm stuck. I'm stuck. I, have no, I can't choose anything else because I've already done it, right? But you see, what we choose is what we get. So if we choose to love God, then we are promised eternal life. If we choose to reject God, then we've chosen eternal damnation. And we've got to keep that in mind, right? We've got to keep that in mind. So then... The Eucharist, as we said, is the source and summit of the Christian life, right? The other sacraments and indeed all ecclesiastical ministries and works of the apostolate are bound up with the Eucharist and oriented toward it. For in the Blessed Eucharist, it is contained the whole spiritual good of the church, namely Christ, our Paschal mystery. That's the Catechism, 1324. The Lord in this once and for all covenant gives us the promise of eternal life and he also invites us to enter into his love. So when we partake in the Eucharist and spend time before him in the adoration, it should inflame us with his love and should truly inspire us to go out and spread the love he gives to those who need that love. It's not a love that we just keep for ourselves. It's a love that we have to go out and also spread. It is also in receiving his love in the true presence that we can be truly healed. To be able to get to know the Lord and experience, not just intellectually, but in the very depths of our souls, we must allow him to show himself to us and seek him. Allow us to experience the Lord. Right. So now... I'd like to lead us in a guided meditation, right? We won't have exposition, but, but I do want us to take a look at this picture and just look, look upon them. And just allow yourself to be transported to a moment of deep contemplation deep adoration of our Lord.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like for us to pause for just a few moments and allow ourselves to become aware of Jesus' gift of himself in the Eucharist. Realize that at this very moment, the Lord of life is gazing upon you with great love. Allow yourself to receive his loving gaze. You are his beloved child. Rest in his loving gaze. Thank Jesus for the gift of himself in the Eucharist. Jesus, help me to recognize your love for me and to remain in that love. Now allow the words of scripture to wash over your mind and heart. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you through this passage. In the days to come, the mount of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest mountain. It shall be raised above the hills and peoples shall stream to it. He shall judge between many peoples and set terms for strong and distant nations. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. One nation shall not raise the sword against another nor shall they train for war again. In days to come, the mount of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest mountain. It shall be raised above the hills, and peoples shall stream to it. He shall judge between many peoples, and set terms for strong and distant nations. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. One nation shall not raise the sword against another, nor shall they train for war again. Allow yourself to sit with these questions for a while, being attentive to how the Lord is speaking in your heart. Our God is a God who keeps his promises. We are told in Micah that in the future, the mount of the Lord's house will be established as the highest mountain. Nations will turn instruments of war into the peaceful tools of daily life. However, it can be hard to see and trust this in a world torn by war and conflict. And so do I ask you, do you trust in the depths of your heart that our loving God will keep this promise? Talk to Jesus about any struggles or doubts and ask him how he wants to increase your trust in his love.
again, allow the words of Scripture to wash over your mind and heart. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you in a personal way through this passage. As the Father loves me, so I also love you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is my commandment. Love one another as I love you. As the Father loves me, so I also love you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is my commandment. Love one another as I love you. In the Gospels, we are given the key to true peace, love. Jesus Christ assures us that he loves us as the Father loves him, totally, completely, eternally. This love becomes the basis of our love for each other. Often our lack of love for others stems from our own belief that we are not truly loved or even that we are not lovable. What areas of your heart feel as if they are not loved? With patience and compassion for your own wounds, gradually show these to Jesus. Ask him to reveal to you how he wants to love you precisely there. What are the areas of your heart that feel as if they are not loved? Invite Jesus into those areas. O oh God, merciful and strong, who crush wars and cast down the proud, be pleased to banish violence swiftly from our midst and to wipe away all tears, so that we may all truly deserve to be called your children. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. So at every Mass, when we come to Mass and we receive Jesus in the Eucharist, he offers himself to the Father for us. His love is so intense and so dear for us that he is constantly offering himself back to the Father for us. 
And so this Sunday, when you come, offer your own offerings with Jesus. Offer yourself up with Jesus to the Father. Allow yourselves to be united in his love. Be united in that ultimate covenant of love, which is the Blessed Sacrament. The Eucharist is a source and summit of our faith, of all Christian life, precisely because it is He who is present in the Eucharist. It is He who commands us to live faithfully in God, and it is He who also teaches us in obedience and in love what it means to receive the grace of God. And so whenever you go to the Eucharist, my brothers and sisters, remember that the Eucharist is the fulfillment of the covenants, the covenants of God's love. And that he wants to share that ultimate covenant, the once and for all covenant of his body, blood, soul, and divinity. So that whatever might be going on in your life, you may know that he is there. You may know that he's always there. He knows more than we know what is good for us and that he wants to share his divine love with us. Offer your desire to love others as Jesus loves you and confident that individual acts of love lead to lasting and universal peace. And unite that love always to the holy sacrament of the altar. May we have life in the Eucharist. May we have love in the Eucharist. May we have eternal blessing in the Eucharist. And so, my brothers and sisters, with this, I wrap up our time together. And I just invite you to allow yourself to spend more time in just being with Jesus in the Eucharist. I guarantee you that you will find great things just spending time with Him. You might go in there and say, I had no idea what to do, Father. What do I do? What do I do? Nothing. Do nothing. Remember the words that God says, be still and know what? That I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Just be there with him, right? Fulton Sheen, Venerable Fulton Sheen, he uh, one time with seminary and asked him, he said, Father, what do I do that I go into, into adoration and I fall asleep? I feel so horrible. And the venerable Archbishop Fulton Sheen said, what better place to sleep than in the arms of our Savior? And another one said, Archbishop, what do I do? I don't know what to do when I go to adoration. He says, just allow yourself to get a little burnt by the sun. Just allow yourself to truly spend time with him. And allow what we know up here, that he is truly present to infiltrate everything about us. Ask the Holy Spirit to really inflame your heart so that you may come to know him in an experiential way. Not academic, but in the experience. And if you have trouble, ask Jesus to guide you. Remember what Thomas did. Unless I put my fingers into his wounds, I will not believe. The Lord appears and he says, Thomas, come. Put your fingers in my hands and your hand in my, in my side. See that it is I. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Thomas is moved when the Lord helps him in his unbelief. So allow yourself then to be filled with God's grace. And if you have trouble believing in the Eucharist, ask him to show you, to increase your belief in him. May God bless you, may God keep you, and may God love you. Amen. Thank you. Good evening. I not formal today because it's my day off. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I want to thank you, Father Henry, for the time, for this beautiful team on the Eucharist, something that we 
uh, important for us to go deeper, uh, to know more about the Eucharist, but not only to know more, but also our active uh, participation in the sacred Eucharist. This is what uh, makes sense to our lives and makes sense to our spiritual life. So thank you, Father. Any questions for Father Henry? Not for me. <laughs> it was clear as mud, huh? <laughs> well, the, rea the reality is, like I said, you, you can't really, I mean, we could go and read books on this all day. But it's not until you actually allow yourself to experience his presence, Right? Uh, you know, back in our diocese, every, every February, we have what's called the Diocesan Catholic Youth Conference. And we have about 3,500 youth that go to this conference. And, and it's interesting because when they, when they first arrive, a lot, of these guys, a lot of these kids are forced to be there, right? And you say, oh, I'm just like, oh, right. But you know, it's amazing. The, the last night that we're all gathered together, they have the adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. And at the same time, simultaneously, there's confessions. There's like 30 priests hearing confessions. And you know, those kids that were, came in there being forced, you know, just by the presence of Christ in the Eucharist, man, you talk about floods of tears and healing that happens. And that's not even with like the, like the, like the person, the priest preaching to them. It's just Jesus just being there. So that's what I'm saying, like, we can go through all these different things, academic things, read and write and all this stuff, but it doesn't compare to the actual experience of being in his presence. And so I just want to encourage you, right, please take time to be in his presence, right? Please have, make time to be in his presence. Okay, any, any questions before we, we wrap up or comments or funny stories? I like, you know, I like stories, and then I can, I can use them for my homilies later. Well, honestly, I, I would say, and, and, and uh, you know, Father Miguel knows that I don't, I don't mince words, right? I'm very direct to it, and I think it's the fault of the church. Because we, we, we've become laxative in the Eucharist, right? We've become laxative in, in, in really, truly communicating the beautiful gift that we have of the true living presence of Christ, right? Uh, you know... And, and the other part, too, is that sometimes, and I, when I talk about the church, I'm not just talking about the priests and the bishops. I'm talking about all of us, laity included, right? That we don't go out and, and speak about the passion that we have about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, so uh, I, had, I had a young lady uh, just a couple of weeks ago who came up to me. She said, Father, I was invited to a non-denominational church. Can I go? I said, sure, you can go, but you better come here first. You know, and she said, well, but I'm going to church. I said, you're going to go be entertained. I said, but here you're coming to receive the truth, and that is the body and blood and soul of Jesus Christ. I said, don't, don't go and be, don't go cheap. <laughs> I said, you want to get the, you want to get the full, the full menu, and that is his, his body and blood, right? So, but see, that's the thing is sometimes we kind of shy away from that, right? We get to this place where we say, well, like, for example, our family members, hey, I'm going to start going to, I don't know, Shoreline. It's one of the non-denominationals there in Austin. Well, okay, as long as you're going to church. But we really should say, okay, why are you going there and not coming to the Catholic church anymore? And allow them to express that and be able to respond to that, right? And I think a lot of times it's just that. Well, I don't feel anything. Well, why don't you feel anything? It's probably because we're just sitting there being zombies at Mass. The Lord be with you and with your spirit, right? You know, there has to be a, a, a reawakening, and that's why the, 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 the bishops of the United States have implemented this Eucharistic revival, 
right, to reinvigorate us in that, that love and passion for the Eucharist. Right? When we come to Mass, we should come to Mass with this, with this complete change of mind that says, I am about to enter into heaven. Right? Like one of the mystics says, when Mass is celebrated, it is heaven that comes and kisses down upon the earth. And while we're in the celebration of the Eucharist from the very beginning, when the priest walks in, it is, the, the, it is Christ in the, in, in the priest, in persona Christi, the, the, the priest, who is entering in our midst. Right? We, our mind should completely be focused on the, and the, the, the miraculous thing that's happening before us, right? But sometimes it even gets down to the point where, I'll, I don't like Father. He's a horrible person. So we see him walking down the aisle. Pff, when in reality, it doesn't matter if Father might be a jerk. But at that moment, Father is in the person of Christ. He's in persona Christi. And there we have entered into heaven, Right? And that's why also for us as priests, it's important that when we celebrate the Eucharist, that it is not a hapsodatical thing. It's something that we must do with great reverence and with great importance. There's a little sign in my, in my sacristy where I vest, and the sign says, Priest of God, celebrate the Mass as if though it were your first Mass, your only Mass, your last Mass. Imagine if all of us as priests prayed the Mass in that way. Imagine if us laity prayed the Mass in that way. What a difference it would make. So yeah, so going back to that question, I think it has to do a lot with that. Is that we've kind of become laxadatical with the Eucharist. It has, it's no longer a great importance for us. And we see this even now, right, with like families... Oh, I couldn't go to Mass because there, my, my son had a, a game to play. Football, soccer, whatever it might be. So we just decided to go and we didn't get to Mass. Or even the worst one that I really, it's one of my pet peeves, right? Because my, my mom did it once and man, she got it from me, right? She, oh, I had family that came into town so I wasn't able to come to Mass. Why the heck didn't you bring them to Mass with you? Right? We give other things priority. And that's what's causing us to fall away. The 65% that say that they only believe it's a, it's a symbol is because we have not continued to enforce the reality that has been held from the very first century. I was, I was going to bring a bunch of, of quotes from the, the church fathers, but I decided not to because then we'd be here till like, you know, 1 o'clock in the morning, Right? But the church fathers very clearly from the very first century speak about the truth of the presence, the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And they were so willing to take that seriously that there are multiple martyrs throughout our history of our Catholic faith that died defending the Eucharist. I would have ventured to ask people now today, would you die if somebody came into your church and decided to desecrate the Eucharist? Would you die for the Eucharist? I said that the other day to some people. I said, hey, if somebody comes in with a gun and they go straight to the Eucharist, I'm going to jump in front of the Eucharist. And they kill me, that's fine, because then I'm going straight to heaven. Father, you can't think that way. I said, you better believe I will. Because, uh, man, I'll tell you what, I need a fast pass to heaven, right? And if I die for the faith, <laughs> I'm in the clear, right? I have nothing to worry about. Right. You're right. <laughs> That's true. That is so true. And, you know, it's, it's funny because uh, there's, there's, a, there's a Spanish priest. His name is uh, 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 Father Toro, right? Toro. And, and uh, you know, he has, he has these Protestants that come up and they, they, they start, you know, they have the Bible. And they're, you know... And they're, they're, they're talking about the Bible, and, and Father Luis Toro is like, well, let me tell you what it actually says, right? So he goes, so, 
But then the other thing that, that, that they'll say, oh, when I was Catholic, I was a drunkard. I was this. And he's like, no, 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 no. Don't say when you were a Catholic. Say when you were a person that didn't know the faith. Because because you were Catholic doesn't mean you're going to come and be a, a womanizer or what have you. That, that's not what the, hey, everybody come to the Catholic church. You can be a drunkard here. No, right? You chose to be a drunkard because you chose not to allow yourself to enter into the faith. Right? And it's true. It's true, right? Yeah? So, yes, that's true. We, we, as, as laity, right, it's important for us to keep learning, to keep learning about the Eucharist. Absolutely. Absolutely about the faith. I mean, what does it mean? What, I, you know, I, I, I would venture to say that majority of people probably have no idea what each motion of the Mass even means. Like, like the, the, the fact of the, the procession coming in, they think, oh, it's just, it's just Father coming in. He's looking great in his robes, right? Oh, man, it's just it's Father coming in. He's, he's, he's you know, modeling for us the robe. No, there is, a, there is an actual theological reason for the procession. For the procession. And if you look at the book of Revelation, oh, man, we're going to go into a whole other topic here, right? Because I love talking about the book of Revelation. But in the book of Revelation, it talks about that John sees... He sees our Savior who is coming down in robes of gold. He's coming to his throne. <laughs> and he ascends to his throne. I mean, okay, we're going to stop there because I, I can go, we can start a whole other mission on, on the Mass, right? But, but the thing is that, that if we were just to stop and really kind of take step by step and saying, what is it? Why do we do that? Why do we kneel? Why do we stand? Why do we do this? Why do we do that? Why does Father do this? Why does Father do that? If we were to stop and really uh, get a deeper understanding for it, the Mass would taste a lot different. Right? Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Sure. It's a beautiful thing in theory, but it distracts from the, act the actuality of the Eucharist. Right? Because, the, so one thing that, that, that is very important is that we follow the rubrics according to what the church has given us. Right? Now, does that mean that we can't have, you know, even a mock mass, or it's not really a mass, but we're going to walking through it and saying, this is what's happening now. Yeah, that's, that we, we, I've had that happen before, right? Where we're not actually celebrating the mass, but the, but the priest is walking through it as if though he's celebrating with vestments and, every, and everything, right? Just to kind of show what's happening in this moment, right? Which, which is, is the, it's called a teaching mass, right? But it's not the actual celebration of the mass, so it doesn't distract from the the severity of what's happening, right? But yeah, I agree with you. And, and again, you know, the reality too is that as priests, there are so little of us now, right? Like my, I have, I'm a, a, a the single priest for a, a parish of 2,200 families, right? They're already calling me, but since I've been here, they've been sending me messages, when can we meet with you? <laughs> well, let's wait till May because that's when my openings are, right? But you see, but this is where the laity come in again, right? The laity could simply say, hey, let's walk through the Mass together, right? Let's walk through it, right? And it's a, it's a beautiful thing. There's another question. Yes. I guess I always bring it up, like I guess in moral order, the way you do it. I'm always just wondering, how do you get the anointing still out of the Lord? Just, uh, or, um, sorry. So my question is, because ultimately we need to, and I guess to let God do something, Sure, I agree with you. <laughs> well, the, the reality is that the only reason why we have Eucharistic ministers is precisely what I just said, right? The fact that we have less priests, right? In the, in the years past, you would have had three, four, five priests at one parish, 
right? And it would have been so easy to, to give communion to everybody from the, the hand of the priest, right? Because even at one point, the deacons didn't give communion. Right? It was just the priest, right? For that main reason, what you said, right? Our, our, our hands are consecrated, right? Uh, not just the fingertips, but the entire hand is consecrated, right? Uh, so, so, but the, the thing is that because we're so stretched thin, that it's hard for us to have, you know, like, for example, at, at my masses, and Father Miguel saw this, we have about, about 1,400 people in one mass, right? And so, so have, being able to give communion to all of them, right, uh, would, be, would be very difficult to get through all of them, right? And at the same time, keeping the reverence, because, you know, then I have another mass coming up right after that, right? Let's get you through. No, 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 no let's not, right? Let's, let's slow this puppy down, right? Um, and so, so yeah, it would, it, it's a beautiful thing. You know, I personally... I love the traditional Mass. It's a beautiful thing. I love, you know, I, you know, I've gone to Masses before where you kneel and receive the Eucharist, right? And as a matter of fact, I'm not, I'm not putting this in your people's mind, okay? Just, just sharing what I've done. As a matter of fact, um, back in, on Corpus Christi, I always put out the kneelers on Corpus Christi Sunday, right? And I tell people, if you wish, you may kneel. Tell you what, majority kneel, right? Um, but again, there is that external expression of reverence and the internal reality of reverence, right? So we have to be careful to not just make it all external, but really make it internally, right? Uh, and that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's one of those things where we have to kind of keep in balance with it, but also keeping the reverence of it, right? Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, back there. Say that again. Why did Jesus want to save our sins? Well, I think I'm going to rephrase that a little bit, okay? So Jesus forgives our sins, right? Meaning that Jesus says, gone, right? Yeah, and why? Because he loves us, right? Remember that I, I spoke about how God continuously sought us out through the covenants, and then here is Jesus now, and he is the fulfillment. He is the, the lamb and he is the priest. And he takes all of our sins and he says, now you have forgiveness of sins, right? And so for us, it's important that we come to Jesus and allow him to forgive us our sins, right? So why does he forgive our sins? Because he loves us, right? Yeah, just kind of like when you do something wrong, right? Your mom might get after you for a little bit, but she doesn't hold a grudge against you, right? It's done, right? Same thing with Jesus. Jesus says, I forgive you, right? Yeah, you might have a little bit of extra things, and we could talk about that later, the purgatory thing, right? But that's, that's another topic, right? Again, another, another whole different mission, right? But, but that's a good question. That's a good question. Was there another question? Yes. First of all, I would, I would recommend that you read a book by Dr. Scott Hahn called Rome Sweet, Rome Sweet Home, right? Beautiful, give, beautiful book, and he explains it so beautifully, right? And then I would venture to say to go, and he, go ahead and just read everything Scott Hahn writes, yeah. <laughs> right? Because uh, <laughs> he does a wonderful job, right? Uh, but, Father, do you all have classes here for, for people that want to learn more, like RCIA? Perfect. So. Oh, there's Bible studies. Oh, let's see. Right. Sure. So, so the, the, the thing is that, that Scott Hahn writes on that, right? His books are very clear. Uh, like what I was talking about, the book of Revelation, he goes into greater depth in the, in the Lamb's Supper. He goes into great depth into that. Right. So I would just say go and buy, or you can even now, you can even listen to it on Spotify, his, the, the, uh, the e-books or whatever they're called. Uh, or, yeah, I think they're called e-books. I can't remember what they're called. But anyways, they're, they're all there. So you can, like, if you're working, you can just pop in headphones and listen to it. It's, all, it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Okay, we're not going to start condemning people, right? <laughs> Yeah, we don't want to, if we, when you start saying nobody comes, nobody comes, then everyone, no one comes. 
There, yes, we invite you to come. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have, to, we, we, have, we, have to, we have to learn our faith, right? That's important for us. We have to learn our faith. You know, I, you know last, last, last story, I promise, last story. So when I was newly ordained a priest, right, and, um, you know, the Jehovah Witnesses come and, right, and, and mom came to the door and, and she's, you know, she opens the door and they're, you know, hey, you know, and they're going on and on and on and they're pointing at the Bible and stuff. And mom is like, ah, yeah, 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 you know, yeah. She goes, you know what? She goes, I, I, I'm really busy, but you know what? My son is here and he loves this stuff, right? And so, so mom says, she says, Henry, right? So I come to the door and say, yeah, mom. She goes, you know, these people want to talk to you. I said, oh, okay. So I walk up and then. Oh, hi. Hi, sir. Uh, yeah, we're da-da-da from, from, you know, the, uh, the, the, the whole witness, blah, 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 you know, and, and, and they're going on and on, and they start pointing things in the Bible, and I said, oh, that's great. Can I see your Bible, please? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So you're giving me this, this little part, but look, why don't we read the entire context of what you're just reading? Because what you're pointing out is not what it's saying. And so then I'm going, you know, teaching them about it, and they're like, oh, oh, well, well, oh, well, what about this one? Oh, yeah, 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 sure, let's look at that one. Okay, now, oh, well, we'll look at this. Look, not what you're saying either, right? As a matter of fact, it's saying contrary to what you're saying. Oh, 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 oh yeah, but, 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 what, what faith are you? What faith are you? I said, I'm a, I'm a Catholic. Oh, and that's when they, they take off, right? <laughs> and so... <laughs> So then, you know, they're, they're trying to tell me how the Catholic Church was, was began by Constantine and all this stuff. And I said, whoa, slow your horses there, buddy. Right. And I went into a crash course in church history. Right. From the very beginning all the way to the 1500 when Martin Luther decided to be disobedient and went off and did all, you know. <laughs> so, of course, at the same time, his, like, you know, the guy's like standing there with me and I'm standing right in front of him and his buddy behind him is like, we should go. We should go, right? Like he's, he's trying, you know, and, and so then finally the guy, he has, he goes, he looks at me and he goes, how do you know so much? I said, oh, I forgot to tell you, I'm a Catholic priest. Oh, well, okay, you have a good one. And they left. <laughs> but you see, if we, if we learn our faith, right, like she's saying, if we learn our faith, we can give answers. And as Peter says, St. Peter says it very clearly, always be prepared to give reason for why you believe, right? Always give, be ready, right? So we must be ready for it, to give our, our, our witnesses, right? We must be ready, and we have to do our part, right? And don't wait for Father Miguel to come and, and, and lead you there, right? He's shepherding you as, as a whole, but it's our responsibility to go deeper, right? It's our responsibility to seek the Lord, right? And like I said... Spend time with Jesus. There is no better school to be in than in the presence of the Lord. Amen? Very good. All right. Thank you, Father Henry. Uh, also, I just uh, want to invite you. We have a box for a donation. If you, you would like to give a donation to Father Henry, so you can deposit in the box in the back. So thank you very much. Thank you for, that, uh, for your attendance. Hopefully, we'll continue bringing uh, good topics uh, for during the year. Uh, hopefully, no only during Advent or for Lent, but also uh, hopefully to bring something uh, for our community to continue growing in, in the knowledge of our sacraments, but also in the knowledge of our faith. I thank you very much. So. You lead us in prayer. Absolutely. Yes. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Knowing that we are loved by Jesus, and living from that place of love, we can, it can truly change our lives. We ask the Lord now to fill us to the brim with his divine love for us and his presence in our lives. We ask the Lord to continuously pour out his blessing upon us and to help us to grow in deeper love with him, that he may become truly present in everything that we do. 
Lord, we ask you that as we have spent these last two days pondering and contemplating on your love, and especially on the great gift of the love of the Eucharist, we ask you, Lord, that as we go forth from these two days, that you may inflame in our hearts the deeper love, reverence, and hunger for the Eucharist. May we be ambassadors of the Holy Eucharist, your presence to the world. May we be passionate about proclaiming the true presence of yourself in our churches, in our tabernacles, and most importantly, in the Eucharist. Help us to be always witnesses and ministers of your love. Blessed Mother Mary, Mother of the Eucharist, we ask you to pray for us and to help us to be humble and full of, your gra of the grace of Christ, just like you were, so that we may truly do whatever he tells us to do. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. And thank you all again. If you're ever in Maynard, come look me up, right? And you might see me here every once in a while because I come visit my, my brother every once in a while, right? Uh, when he invites me. Sometimes he doesn't want me around. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Thank you all again very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a blessed evening.